Source, The Dangers in My Heart. The story starts with Ichikawa Kyutaro, who is reading a murder encyclopedia in class and is feeling like he's messed up in the head. Meanwhile, his classmates are busy cracking toilet paper jokes, you know, the highbrow stuff. Ichiko is so tormented that he even considers lashing out at a boy who accidentally bumps into him. But he quickly realizes it's not exactly the best idea. It's like he thinks he's the star of some twisted psychological thriller or something. I mean, come on my man, you're not the Joker. But he can't help but wonder when his bloodthirsty urges will finally subside. And then there's Anna Yamada, the apple of Ichikawa's eye, or, more accurately, the target of his homicidal fantasies. She's the prettiest girl in school and magazine model, but Ichikawa just wants to see her beautiful face writhing in pain. Yikes, he can hardly control himself when she glances at him, and now he wants to make her regret looking down at him. Someone please tell him to calm down. He thinks she will look just as gorgeous as a corpse and her body will belong to him. Well, dunno why he's suddenly acting like a pervert. He gets up and leaves because the classroom gets unbearably loud during lunch break. He enters the library and sees Anna sitting there alone having lunch. He uncomfortably walks in and she says something indistinguishable with her mouth full. Someone please teach the girl some manners. Nevertheless, Ichikawa pretends to understand and walks away from her. He is peeking at her through gaps in the bookshelves, wondering if this is his chance to kill her and decides against it. He just observes her as she finishes her rice cake and opens a bag of potato chips. Ichikawa is shocked since they just had lunch, and she is now smiling and tapping while finishing the party-sized packet of chips. Man, let the girl enjoy her food in peace. He turns around and starts thinking of ways to kill her, but she seems to be working on her presentation for social studies. Ichikawa notices that Anna doesn't use a pencil first for reference and directly uses a pen to write, and ends up running out of space while writing the heading. Classic rookie mistake. However, he can't help but notice that she's looking for her box cutter, and he considers lending it to her, until he realizes that might come off as a little creepy. Can't blame the guy for being cautious in today's world, right? He decides to take the risk anyway, and to his surprise, Anna is actually nice about it. She smiles and thanks him for decreasing her workload, and Ichikawa feels like he's on top of the world, until he realizes that she hasn't returned the box cutter yet. Panic sets in as he frantically chases after her in the hallway. Of course, Anna's got her own problems to deal with, like her friend accusing her of hoarding snacks. Hey, who doesn't love a good snack, right? But Anna's a sweetheart and runs back to Ichikawa to give him the rest of the chips. MC thinks he's hit the jackpot with Anna's leftovers, but she quickly puts the packet directly over her mouth to get the last few chips out. That's not very laddie like but who can argue with a beautiful model? Her friend starts screaming about her making him do her dirty work, and Ichikawa slumps to the floor because he didn't get a chance to murder her. He spends the rest of the day thinking about his box cutter and her pencil case, but is surprised to find it on his desk the next day. He touches it, and it's still warm, making him believe she carried it in her hands all the way to school so she wouldn't forget. Who knew a box cutter could be so romantic? Their teacher announces it's time for them to give their group presentations, but Anna is confused when she sees the poster is different from what she prepared. Her friend told her she had redone it because Anna made it messy with food stains. She even used a chocolate stain to make it part of the heading. Ichikawa is furious since he thinks Anna worked hard on it, and her friend is jealous of her beauty. He starts cursing girls in general for being devious, but he notices that Anna seems unbothered. She and her friend group go first and give their presentation while Ichikawa and his group go next talking about their research on sustainable resources. However, while he is giving his presentation she seems quiet and starts crying. To make matters worse, Ichikawa's obsession with Anna has him thinking that the entire class is staring at her, when in reality, they're just looking at a helicopter. Classic Ichikawa, but he's not going to let this moment pass him by, so he tears down his own poster to distract the class. Hey, whatever works, right? But here's the kicker, when he looks back at Anna, she's happily watching the helicopter. Talk about a plot twist. Ichikawa's more confused than ever, but hey, at least he got to make a dramatic statement in front of the class. Maybe next time he'll bring a helicopter of his own to really steal the show. Anna sits on Kobayashi's lap, and the boys behind MC start making perverted jokes about them. They want to be friends with benefits with Anna, but he is not having any of it. He's ready to murder them, as usual. One of the boys, Kanzaka, starts talking about how he's not into pretty girls and would prefer someone less attractive, like Hara. Poor Hara, 
Later, MC goes to the library and sees Anna there, enjoying some snacks. Hara enters because someone asked her to meet there, but she refuses Anna's offer of food because she's on a diet. Kanzaka then enters, and MC is hiding behind a shelf, afraid he might be about to ask Hara out. When Kanzaka finds out about Hara's diet, he tells her that he likes her just the way she is, and that she doesn't need to lose weight. Anna figures out what's going on, but then MC accidentally drops a book, making everyone suspicious of someone else's presence. They think it's a cat, so Anna starts coughing to signal it to him. He gets the hint and meows while Anna gets up with the excuse to check what's happening, but actually wants to help him. She finds him behind the bookshelf and starts mewing too, which makes Hara and Kanzaka burst out laughing. They become friends, united by their love of cats. Isn't that just perfect? MC is on his way home from school and decides to stop at the store to purchase the magazine that Anna has been featured in. But he doesn't want to go inside in his school uniform, so he changes into a heavy metal goth t-shirt. As one does. Once inside, he finds the magazine but is interrupted as Anna walks in. He runs and hides behind a shelf so she can't see him, like a true ninja. Two girls enter to show interest in buying the magazine, but Anna acts all awkward, trying to get them to notice her and fangirl around her. Unfortunately, they get uncomfortable and leave. Poor Anna, it's tough being famous. Undeterred, Anna stands with a pen in her hand ready to give out autographs, but no one recognizes her. She even tries to place her magazine on top of another pile to get more people to buy it, but the shop attendants just fix it without paying attention to her. When she leaves dejectedly, MC realizes that she has a cringeworthy side to her personality as well. Feeling guilty for the two customers Anna scared off, Ichikawa buys the magazine and goes home to read it. But after seeing Anna's pictures, he throws those in the trash, pretending not to care. Of course, he can't help but see the magazine from the corner of his eye and stays up all night reading it. We've all been there, Ichikawa. Anna may not have gotten the attention she was hoping for at the store, but she'll always have Ichikawa to secretly obsess over her. The next day, while walking to school, Ichikawa sees Anna talking to another boy and immediately assumes he is her boyfriend. He accepts this fact as the way of the world and goes to stand next to them on the sidewalk. He overhears the boy, Haria Nanjo telling her about an app called Line and assumes he is hitting on her. Classic teenage jealousy. As they start walking, Ichikawa trails a short distance behind them, eavesdropping on their conversation. Not very good manners, but he can't help himself. Haria asks Anna about her social media accounts, but she seems clueless about them. MC thinks she's plain dumb, because how could anyone not know about social media, especially a magazine model? Haria persists, asking Anna how she stays in touch with her friends. Anna replies that they read each other's minds by tuning their brains to the same wavelength. Haria is impressed and asks her to read his mind, but Anna distracts him by asking for ice cream. Priorities right? Haria continues to compliment Anna as he moves closer to her and calls her cute. He continues by calling her funny, and she is actually enjoying it as she asks for more. This only makes Ichikawa more miserable, and he falls further behind. Haria insists Anna should know about Line so they can talk more. He even holds her hand, and she seems to respond positively because she doesn't let go, leaving Ichikawa's eyes wide open as he pretends not to care. Anna takes out her phone to install the app when Ichikawa has had enough and something snaps inside him. He cannot tolerate this open flirting any longer and decides to take action. In a brief moment of insanity, he sends his bike flying at full speed past Haruya and Anna, startling them both. Anna's friend Chi witnessed the whole incident since she was walking behind him and everyone rushes over to see the bike which had unfortunately landed in the water. She tells Anna that Ichikawa had intentionally sent his bike flying. Intrigued, she asks MC about what happened, but he's embarrassed so he quickly tries to cover himself by saying, I accidentally hit the gas instead of the brakes. Wait? Gas on a bicycle? Anna starts laughing uncontrollably and calls him funny, which of course makes time stop for him as he starts to feel butterflies and sees no one but Anna in his universe. The next day starts with our MC thinking of writing a book based on a boy who gets transported to another world. Hmm, why is it always about being Isakad? The boy is cursed with black magic and dooms anything he touches. The design of the heroine looks familiar to Yamada. MC then visits the nurse's office even though he looks totally fine. There he sees Yamada lying next to the nurse's bed. 
N.C. explains that he had a severe headache that's why he's at the nurse's office. Yamada seems to have a stomach ache due to eating too many candies. Yamada hands M.C. a pill who gets excited when he notices that he'll be drinking from the same glass that Yamada's lips have touched. This kid needs some milk. But there he notices that Yamada left her shirt. M.C. couldn't hold himself and he starts to sniff the shirt as the nurse hands him the shirt to return it. He repeatedly blames a creature inside his skull for his pervy actions. Later, M.C. returns to his class where the boys, 12 years kids, would ask the girls if they touched themselves. A boy hands M.C. a note and asks him to give it to Yamada. He swaps the note with his sketch and gives it to Yamada. Moments later, he continues his sketch. Meanwhile, the boys come up with a game that reveals someone's favorite yoga position. The boy approaches the girls and asks them to hold his hand. The way the girls are going to hold their fists will reveal their favorite yoga position. These kids and their theory. But a girl suspects him and asks him to do this test with his friends first. Well, that backfired. Anyways, the girls find various methods to touch his hand while the boys start to make weird assumptions. Later at the library, Yamada tries to open Ichikawa's fist to find her missing piece of candy. MC also uses their theory and assumes Yamada's favorite position, Kid is getting brainwashed. Later on the basketball court, the coach asks the kids to split into a team of five people. Yamada refuses when her friend asks her to stand in the defense. Yamada has an upcoming photo shoot, so she needs to lose weight by running. She has curves, no idea what weight she is talking about. MC then wonders how open Yamada is but yet he doesn't know her well. MC defines Yamada's personality as easy to murder. As MC was still thinking he got hit by the basketball, MC was about to throw the ball in anger. It turns out Yamada was the one to throw that ball to Ichikawa. Ichikawa's rage immediately calms down and he returns the ball calmly. We all know where this is going. MC notices that Yamada is staring at him while blushing. Yamada gets hit in the face by the basketball as she was distracted by looking at Ichikawa. Yamada's nose starts to bleed due to the hit. MC starts to get worried as he sees the blood flowing from Ichikawa's nose. The coach then takes Yamada to the nurse's office along with Kobayashi. MC secretly walks into the nurse's office. He is shocked when the coach tends to call at Yamada's parents. The situation seems a bit serious. MC hides under the nurse's bed. MC sees Yamada's bloody tissues. Hopefully the kid doesn't do anything pervy with that. While talking with her mother, Yamada starts to cry, because due to her injury, Yamada can't go for the photo shoot. After seeing Yamada cry, MC also starts to cry unintentionally. Yamada accidentally drops her stuff on the ground where he notices that she has framed his sketch. It touches Ichikawa's heart. That's when MC realizes that he likes Yamada. Later in the classroom, the pervy boys gather together. One of the boys has Yamada's bloody tissue and starts to flex it. Are they really 12-year-old kids? That pisses MC, and as he stands to confront them, MC notices blood spots on his shirt. Turns out when he was crawling his way out of the nurse's office, his shirt got touched with Yamada's blood on the floor. MC sits immediately while trying to hide the stains. The next day, Yamada shows up at the school with a bandage on her nose. Everyone approaches her and asks her what happened. Yamada tells everyone the reason. She gets tired of explaining it to everyone, so Kobayashi writes the reason why Yamada has an injured nose on the bandage so people would stop asking her. Yamada starts to cry and hugs Kobayashi as she still is sad, due to the photo shoot. As Yamada is still hugging Kobayashi, the pervy boys start to get pervy thoughts. Moments later MC was walking into the school and he saw Yamada standing on the stairs. Yamada is still crying and she runs out of tissues. MC wants to give her tissues to cry off but he's too shy to hand her straight away. MC goes to the library where he leaves multiple tissue packets. As Yamada picks up the tissue but instead of wiping her tears she cleans her hands after eating snacks. That made MC happier as he saw Yamada smiling. Our MC is having thoughts about what he meant by saying, I like her. He's confused if he loves her because he doesn't desire to go on a date with her or even spend romantic time with her. While having lunch, MC notices that a girl is staring at Yamada. It was because Yamada was stealing milk. MC follows her to the library where he realizes that he stole the milk pack so she could make Narun Narun Yep, that's the name of the candy. Before Yamada would add the candy to the milk pack, MC interrupted her and asked her to use a bowl from the EC room. Yamada asks him to bring the bowl in an orderly way. With hesitating, MC runs to get the bowl. Where did that Sigma personality go? 
Though halfway Yamada joins him, Yamada then pretends to be better than Gordon Ramsay just for making Nurun Nurun Nurun. The EC room seems to be locked so they decide to steal a beaker from the science lab. Yamada dips Ichikawa's finger into the sweet dish so he could taste him while she drinks the whole. As Yamada is drinking the syrup, their teacher catches them in the lab. Yamada drops the syrup on her thighs as she panics. MC tries to explain to the teacher that the scenario seems a bit awkward. Later, while cleaning the school a girl named Rin approaches Yamada, but before she can say anything Yamada's handkerchief falls down the window and she runs down to get it. Rin's friend Serena tells her to apologize to Yamada for something she did unintentionally. Rin gets pissed and says that Serena has changed now all she does is hang over her and Rin runs off. Moments later, MC and Yamada are in the library. He notices that Rin is also standing there. Maybe she came to apologize. MC tries to walk away as he wants to give them space. Yamada calls him and asks him to take a selfie with her so she may swap the faces with the new filter. MC straight up denies her offer and runs outside the library where he meets Serena. Yamada calls Rin and shows her the picture. She doesn't even remember or care about what Rin did. Yamada takes a selfie with Rin using the swap filter and laughs. Rin starts to feel embarrassed and she suddenly starts to apologize. Turns out Rin was the one to hit the ball at Yamada's face. Yamada acts generously and even asks Rin for candies. As Rin walks out, Serena apologizes to Rin for forcing her to apologize. While walking home, Smarty literally is carrying his cycle. MC notices the fact that everyone cares so much about Yamada's nose. He thinks it is because she's a model. As he was thinking, Yamada appeared next to him. Yamada asks for a lift. MC seems shy but he accepts to give her a lift. Yamada sits at the back of the cycle like how boys sit and asks him to drop her at Muroka's shop. MC mentions that he is part of the data processing club to which Yamada replies that she will also join the same club. As they reach the shop, Yamada hands MC a juice bottle who seems surprised because Yamada barely shares anything. So MC gives her the cap of the juice which has a few drops in it. Yamada walks away blushing. I mean it is a high school romance after all. The next day the teacher asks the class if they know who threw the candy wrappers at the library. Yamada straight up lies that it wasn't her, though it was obvious so the teacher calls her to the office. The teacher gets busy so Yamada is off the hook for now. Later, MC goes for lunch with his sister and seems embarrassed to spend time with her. That's where Yamada and her friends walk next to Ichikawa. As Yamada's group is sitting behind MC, he eavesdrops on their conversation. MC goes to buy more snacks, and that's where Yamada joins him. Yamada mentions that she wants to be friends with his sister. MC then asks her why she came here so Yamada starts making excuses. Turns out Yamada came to the counter just so she could talk to Ichikawa. As MC realizes that, he starts to panic while ordering. He buys an ice cream from Yamada, but gets too shy to hand it to her. Later at school, MC seems to be looking for Yamada, but that's when she appears behind him. As Yamada is about to go to the teacher's office, she asks MC to accompany her. The teacher accuses Yamada of bringing snacks to the school. Yamada seems to neglect these allegations and MC starts defending Yamada. My guy is straight up lying for Yamada. Even though they were caught red-handed in the library, MC starts to trick the teacher and as a result, they both walk off. The teacher seems happy as he sees MC helping someone. As they walk into the hall, Yamada gives MC a candy. Yamada asks MC to chat with her more, and he turns all red from blushing. The class gets an assignment in which they have to visit multiple shops and write a report on them. MC seems to be less interested because he wants to visit crime scenes or drug cartels to make a report. He actually likes dark corners and murder mysteries. The teacher asks the class to make a group of six students who share the same interests. As always, MC sits all alone as he has no friends to make a group. He gets called out by the pervy boys group and they ask him to join them. MC accepts their offer and joins them. The pervy boys notice that their group is still short of two members, so they immediately split their group. Now you'll know why I call them the pervy boys group. Oda and Adaki, two people of that pervy group approach the girls and ask them to let them join. Yamada's friend Sakine immediately rejects him. MC seems relieved. The girls are ready to take anyone in except for them. Sakine tells the boys that the girls will discuss and qualify two people who will join their group. The first person to get qualified by the girls is Kanzaki. But Kanzaki doesn't want to join their group. 
MC suggests Kanzaki to join Hara's group, which is full of nerds, and they will match his level. Kanzaki seems convinced, but now three people are left. MC fights his way to join Yamada's group. She literally could just ask the girls and they would take homeboy in. Adahi also succeeds in joining them. Later in the library, MC seems to think that Yamada would find him desperate for the way he fits his way in her group. Yamada then walks in with Hara while MC watches them sneakily. Turns out Yamada sneaked in some snacks to eat with Hara, wasn't she a model who cared about her weight? Hara rejects Yamada's offer and says that she's on a diet, she only came to the library to talk to her. Yamada starts to get excited because she realizes that Hara came here for her and not for the food. Most probably she's excited because she doesn't have to share now. Turns out Kanzaki and Hara are sort of dating and Hara wishes to lose weight so she could look more pretty. MC is eavesdropping on all their conversations. Hara tells Yamada that they went on a shopping date together. The pervy boy is making progress there. Hara then asks Yamada if she ever had a relationship. Yamada claims that she has never been in a relationship. That gives MC some relief. Yamada reveals that she has the urge to share a pair of earbuds if she ever had a boyfriend. Yamada takes a selfie with Hara, but in that picture, we can see MC sneaking from behind. Kid got caught in 4K, Hara doesn't mind if MC hears their conversation because he has no friends to share that information with. That must have hurt deeply. Later when MC is about to leave the school, it starts raining and MC wears his raincoat. Suddenly, he notices Yamada standing. She asks to borrow Ichikawa's raincoat so she can go and buy herself an umbrella. MC notices that Yamada left her bag and wallet at the school so he runs off to Yamada in the rain. Yamada asks MC to take out her wallet from the bag, but as he puts his hand in the bag he notices that she already has an umbrella. Yamada makes an excuse that the umbrella is broken. MC then places her wallet in her pocket while both of them are blushing. Turns out Yamada lied so she could spend time with him and buy some snacks too. Yamada then returns and so she shares an ice cream with Ichikawa. MC asks if she loves or hates the ice cream but gets distracted. Right when MC leaves, Yamada shouts to him and says I'm practically in love. It is a mystery whether she was talking about the ice cream or herself. The next day the whole group starts to visit various places for their report. At the manga store where Adaki starts to ask pervert questions and even fantasies about an idol's chest size. We all saw that coming. At the manga store, they meet a writer who lets them take a peek at the unreleased Beki's manga, which excites Ichikawa. While returning from the manga store, the lifts get rushed with many people. Yamada seems to be standing too close to Ichikawa. In order to control himself, MC closes his eyes. Can't believe he's the same guy who was sniffing her clothes a few episodes earlier. Though he could smell Yamada's fragrance and feel her breath. Anyway, as the lift reaches its destination, MC opens his eyes to see that Yamada is still standing so close to him even after everyone leaves and the lift gets empty. They stare at each other for some moment and Yamada walks away, so they walk together while talking about mangas. MC then takes a washroom break and as he comes back he realizes that only Yamada is standing there. Turns out everyone took off on the subway because these two forgot to ask them to wait. So MC and Yamada get left behind together. Now that MC and Yamada have been abandoned by their groupmates, they start to panic. Yamada takes the whole blame onto her and starts to cry. Luckily the next train would arrive in about 7 minutes. MC starts to feel guilty so he makes it up by buying Yamada a milk tea. MC thinks that it's all his fault he should have announced that he's about to take a bathroom break, which eventually makes Yamada laugh and she cheers up and so the train arrives. On the train, Yamada holds on to MC so they won't split up. Yamada also mentions that Hara is having a secret relationship. She hints MC about having a secret relationship. Moments later they catch up with their group. The next day as MC is riding to school, he realizes that he has begun to enjoy school. It is because he has started to like Yamada. Yamada seems to be waiting for MC outside the school. As MC arrives Yamada hands him the manga that she previously mentioned. Yamada gets so excited that she spoils the whole manga for Ichikawa. Yamada walks back to the school gate so MC wouldn't know that she was waiting just for him. Moments later, Yamada visits MC at the library even though she is supposed to be busy with her work. Yamada notices that MC is reading some other book and not her manga. She starts to force MC to read that manga right now. She starts to drag Ichikawa's book but gets tripped. Ichikawa's face bumps right into Yamada's chest. Talk about a dream come true moment. 
Both of them apologize to each other. As Yamada is about to leave, MC stops her for no reason. He has no idea why he stopped her and started asking random questions. He starts to read the manga as he reaches home. The next day at the school, the first thing Yamada asks MC is about the manga. She repeatedly keeps asking him about the manga, so he decides to read it at the school. As MC starts reading the manga, he gets interrupted by Adaki. Adaki suspects MC if he's dating Yamada, but he immediately covers it up by saying we're just classmates. Adaki seems to have a crush on Yamada. He keeps asking MC about her. Adaki realizes that he likes Yamada because he isn't able to wank to her. How does a 12-year-old even know about such stuff? According to Adaki, you cannot wank to the girl you like. MC starts to gain interest in the topic. MC wonders if Adaki's theory is right. He is going to try tributing Yamada. Adaki starts to adore Yamada's body, which grosses out MC, and he walks out. MC realizes that Adachi has always talked dirty about Yamada, but he never felt offended before. He questions himself because he has started to like her now. MC walks into the class and sits next to Yamada. Hichikawa's eyes turn to Yamada's thighs unintentionally, so he walks out of the class. As MC walks towards the library, he sees Yamada standing in agony. How did she even get there so fast? Yamada seems sad because the staff sets a new rule that eating in the library is not prohibited. Yamada believes that someone snitched the staff about her, and that's why they have set up this poster. MC and Yamada start to wonder about the identity of the person who ratted them. Before calling out names and suspecting their class fellows, they decide to confront the library teacher. The library teacher mentions that she found a candy wrapper at the library so she had to remind the kids about the rules. Moments later, while Yamada and MC are sitting in the library, MC wonders if this is the last time Yamada will ever come to the library. As Yamada was never interested in reading books, she only goes to the library to eat snacks. MC wonders if that's the end of his bond with Yamada. At that exact moment, Yamada opens a pack of chocolate and starts to eat it. There's nothing that can stop this girl from eating. Yamada knew the rule of not eating in the library from the beginning. A poster doesn't affect Yamada. That's when MC notices the library teacher walking behind Yamada, and she's about to get caught red-handedly. The teacher is about to look at Yamada. MC starts to rush. As Yamada is about to take a bite of the chocolate, MC immediately reaches out his hand and holds Yamada's hand. The chocolate gets hidden between their hands. The library teacher looks at them holding hands so she immediately walks out to give them privacy. Do such teachers even exist? MC then falls back while Yamada glares at him while blushing. MC apologizes for holding her hand with consent. He explains that he did it to save her. The chocolate seems to be melted onto Yamada's hand. Yamada's expression seems to be complicated as she asks MC to go away. Turns out she wanted to lick her hands that's why she asked him to go. MC walks out of the library in a stumbled manner. But the next day everything seemed back to the way it was. MC is at his home, using his laptop. He can't stop thinking about Yamada. MC then googles Yamada's modeling name which is Anna Aquino and starts to stalk. Though he gets pissed when he looks at the search bar where it says, Anna Aquino is ugly. MC starts to trash talk about the people on the internet, but that's when he notices the word kolbaku. MC immediately starts to research it, and it turns out to be a TV show in which Yamada is featured. That show airs every Tuesday, that's where MC realizes that today is Tuesday and rushes towards their TV. At home. Unfortunately, the show ends right before he reaches the TV. The next day as everyone is getting ready for their marathon run. MC is continuously glaring at Yamada. He intends to keep their relationship to where it is. Anyways, as the marathon race is about to begin. As the race begins, everyone starts to run on their own. MC's misogynistic side appears as he realizes that Yamada is about to cross him in racing. He boosts up his speed and on the other hand, and Yamada does the same. Soon after Yamada catches up to MC, she holds MC and asks him to slow down. But MC's pride wouldn't allow him so he again runs ahead of her. As soon as Yamada takes off her gym shirt, MC's speed automatically gets slower and so Yamada covers the distance. Can't blame the boy, Yamada used her wild card. MC can't help himself to stop staring at Yamada's chest, but he realizes that Yamada is wearing her shirt backward. As MC tells that to Yamada, instead of slowing down Yamada flips her shirt while running. That trick doesn't slow Yamada down, instead, MC gets behind her to hide his boner. 
Yamada turns her head behind and sees MC's right eye for the first as he is running. Both of them get distracted by each other so much that they start to run out of the track. As a result, MC ends up in last place. As Yamada is sitting exhausted, she reaches out her hand to MC, and so he holds her hand to give her a boost in standing up. And this kid was a misogynist before he saw those jiggles. Moments later in the classroom, even MC is confused about what to call that holding hand moment. As MC puts his phone down, he notices the name on the gym shirt, and that's when he realizes that he has switched gym shirts with Yamada. That's where MC eavesdrops on Yamada's friend discussing that wearing the clothes of your boyfriend is a love sign. At this point, MC wants to take back his gym shirt, but he doesn't find the right opportunity. MC notices that Yamada is wearing his gym shirt as the class begins. He starts to freak out that anyone can notice her at this point. As the lunch break begins, Yamada calls MC herself and takes him to the nurse's office to return his gym shirt. As Yamada takes off his shirt, she weirdly sniffs the shirt. Yamada takes MC to measure their heights. As Yamada is setting up the scales, his chest is pointed directly towards MC, so he takes his step back and asks Yamada to measure her height. MC had to use a chair to check on Yamada's height. The next day, as MC walks in the class, he notices everyone talking about Yamada appearing in a movie with a famous actor and director. MC notices that Yamada doesn't seem that excited. Anyways, as the class starts, the teacher asks everyone to pick a random number, and they would sit according to it. As MC sits in his new spot, he starts to pray that Yamada would sit next to him, though Yamada does indeed sit close to MC but not next to him. As the lecture begins, MC gets in trouble when he tries to look at the board because Yamada is sitting at the front. Adaki gets lucky and ends up sitting next to Yamada, which pisses off MC. Hara notices him struggling so she shares her notes for him to copy. Though Yamada doesn't seem too happy about that, Yamada seems jealous of MC for interacting with Hara, so MC calms her and says, All I see is you. Both of them start to blush and so Hara walks in. Moments later, MC and Yamada are sitting at the library. MC reveals that he has changed the seating arrangements and now Yamada shall sit where MC previously sat because he couldn't see the board. Poor Adaki. MC then tells Yamada to not be stressed about the movie. Yamada gets excited and asks him if he's into movies. Yamada then reveals that her role in the movie is to be the daughter of the police officer who is chasing the main character. MC notices that Yamada sounds more cheerful than before. I guess she just wanted to share it with him. Yamada tells her big line in the movie which is, You're such a creep. She starts to rehearse this line repeatedly while looking at MC. Everyone starts to look at them, so MC suggests Yamada go somewhere private. They end up sitting in the storage room while MC stands too close to Yamada due to the closed space. As MC says that he might go and see the movie, Yamada gets so happy to hear this as she walks out of the room. Later, MC watches the TV, show in which Yamada is featured. MC starts to feel a bit sad when he notices that the show cuts almost every scene in which Yamada is about to speak. The next day, MC sees Yamada telling her friends about her featuring in the show, even though he thought that she might be uncomfortable sharing that detail. A few days later, Yamada was running towards Sakin and she seemed very worried. Yamada explains that Kobayashi is having a cold, so she can't come to school. Yamada then sits on Sakin's lap. MC seems to be observing Yamada's behavior. To make Yamada move from Sakin's lap, she surprisingly attempts to grab Yamada's chest. As the girls are doing weird stuff, MC is trying his best to distract himself away from the girls' activities. Later, everyone seems to be stressed after the test. Yamada walks towards Kana and Yamada starts to compare herself to Kana, which kind of pisses Kana off. Moments later, MC and Yamada are doing group study in the library, but this time Kana also joins them. MC helps Kana and solves all her questions, though Yamada doesn't seem to be pleased by that. Kana then mentions that the school is holding a parent-teacher meeting soon. Kana also reveals the fact that Yamada talks a lot about MC in front of her, which makes MC feel embarrassed. MC believes that Yamada must have made fun of him in front of her friends. Kana then exposes Yamada's dumb moments which eventually makes MC smirk. It makes Yamada feel more jealous because she never made MC laugh or even smirk. Kana also notices that MC doesn't hesitate when he's talking to Yamada, even though his personality is quite the opposite when he interacts with other girls. Someone please take Kana away. Later, the parent-teacher meeting day arrives. 
as N.C. is coming down for the stairs he sees Adaki's mother pulling her son's ear and taking him away while Adaki is feeling pain and embarrassment. N.C. starts to feel frightened, and as he walks towards her mother he notices Yamada sitting with her mother, weirdly M.C. recognizes her mother by her look. This kid's taste in women is complicated. Yamada's mother is a strict woman as she repeatedly tells Yamada to mind her legs and posture. Even M.C.'s mother gets scared as she is sitting next to Yamada. M.C.'s mother introduces herself to Yamada, and Yamada gets excited. M.C.'s mother asks Yamada to get along with M.C. At this point, M.C. hides behind a wall and spectates their conversation. Yamada nervously tells M.C.'s mother that they already get along. M.C.'s mother then hands Yamada a throat lozenge. It's basically a medical candy, and in return, Yamada gives her candy. Anyways, as the meeting ends, he and his mother start to walk. MC's mother seems impressed because the teacher complimented MC's class participation, but he totally ignores her and starts to walk fast because he doesn't want to get spotted with his mother. I don't get it. What's with these kids and their urge to avoid family bonding in front of the public? MC's mother then shows MC the candy Yamada gave to her. She even starts to praise Yamada's appearance while Yamada is secretly walking behind them. MC's mother then asks MC if he knows the girl she is talking about, and MC says the name Yamada. Both MC's mother and her son look back and notice Yamada standing while blushing. Yamada hurriedly walks away. The next day, MC and Yamada are sitting at the library where Yamada mentions that MC's mother is adorable. Yamada seems to be sitting very close to MC, so he stands up. As Kobayashi is home, Yamada asks MC to teach her science while she drags the history book out. The librarian walks in. MC notices the throat lozenge at the table. He starts to panic because if the librarian sees the packet of throat lozenge, they'll be in huge trouble. Since the library strictly prohibits eating inside, MC slowly whispers to Yamada to hide the lozenge. Weirdly, Yamada jumps and sits on the ground while MC hides the lozenge. Who knew she had a whisper fetish? MC seems to be confused as he sees Yamada turning all red. Later, it is raining while MC is cycling. He feels unlucky because it started to rain as soon as he went outside. He passes by Yamada, who stops MC. Since Yamada has an umbrella, she puts her stuff on the cycle and decides to join. MC denies her offer because it's too dangerous to cycle with two people on a wet street. So both of them go on their way. As MC reaches his home, he notices that Yamada left her stuff on his bicycle. At first, MC thinks that they are just snacks, but as he sneaks inside, he notices a pack of tampons. MC instantly leaves to find Yamada. As he reaches the nearby subway, MC spots Yamada, so he finally manages to return her bag. Yamada slowly whispers in his ears that these tampons aren't for her periods. MC replies very normally to that information and returns home. Moments later, MC stalks Yamada's pictures till he falls asleep, and so he gets a weird dream in which multiple Yamadas of various sizes are following him. MC wakes up in a sweat and realizes that he's got a cold. The next day, Yamada comes by his house to hand him some food. MC then invites her home for tea. He starts to freak out. As MC goes to his room and is about to change his shirt, he starts to get dizzy and so he passes out. Moments pass by and Yamada starts to get worried so she walks into MC's room. Yamada immediately rushes as she sees MC on the floor shirtless. She holds him up to the bed and helps him wear a shirt. Imagine MC's mother walks in. MC is feeling so dizzy that he thinks all of this is just a dream. His head even falls on Yamada's chest. Yamada then hugs MC. Later when MC wakes up, he whispers the name Yamada, but as he opens his eyes he sees Kana sitting there. She mentions that Yamada left a note for him, which says get well soon. The next day Yamada walks into the classroom and asks Ichikawa if he has the line app. Looks like she's finally caught up with present times. Of course he misinterprets and thinks she's making fun of him as he tries to defend himself thinking even people without friends use line. So what if it's just to text his family? He tells her he does and she immediately whips out her phone showing him her funny sticker collection. She offers to send them to him but he refuses. By this time it's pretty obvious she's trying to add him and states how their class doesn't have a group chat especially when the other classes and clubs do. She questions whether the data processing club has one but Ichikawa says he doesn't know. When Yamada insists they should ask about it he admits he doesn't want to because it's such a small club that if he's not part of the group chat it's because they don't want him there. Yamada puts her head down and sprawls on the table in the library. 
her usual spot, and Ichikawa wonders if she even knows what it's like to feel left out. It's the 16th of December and Moko excitedly claims she would do anything to have a boyfriend for Christmas. She's smart enough to know sitting around and wanting one isn't going to get her anywhere and thinks of exchanging line ids with boys in her class. The other two girls don't pay her much attention, but Yamada gets up from her seat approving of it as a great idea. Moko is certain it won't be hard for Yamada to find a boyfriend. Yamada goes to ask Ichikawa, but Moko compares it to a level 99 going to fight slimes. Furthermore, she argues that they're going to ask everyone so Moko agrees and asks him first. This girl literally stares with her mouth wide open because she can't seem to ask him outright. Moko shoves Yamada away before she gets a chance to ask him, claiming she needs to handle the higher-ups. Ishimuro, for instance, is average-looking but is a track team ace and the brightest in the class. It's just Moko who wants his ID and it turns out he and Yamada live in the same building. Moreover, their parents get along and they do talk sometimes. Ichikawa overhears and knows he can't stop her, but he realizes if that's what she was doing when she asked him earlier that morning. It's a moment of instant regret for him, as he winces at the failed opportunity. Later that night, Ichikawa lies miserably in his own bed as he remembers her trying to exchange IDs with him. He tries to console himself thinking she has tons of friends, so it's probably no big deal for her. He starts overthinking about how Yamada probably likes guys who are distant and curt, but really sweet and charming under the surface. He gets all hyped up and stares at the only picture he has of them together. His train of thought gets worse as he tries to calm his nerves and not give himself any hope. The next day he arrives at school only to see Haruya chatting with Yamada talking about the latest game. He even has the audacity to invite her to his place so they play together. Ichikawa seats watching this thinking at least the man can make an effort to hide his real motives. Kobayashi shuts him up saying Yamada only plays Animal Cross Seas, but Yamada interrupts asking her about that game, destroying her cover-up. Ichikawa secretly praises her for keeping up an iron defense. Moko notices a girl standing beside Haruo and Yoshida wonders if she's his girlfriend. But if she was, he wouldn't be approaching Yamada like this, right? Moko corrects her saying he's a real polygamist. Hmm, she seems to know a lot about him. Haruya ends up inviting Kobayashi as well, claiming he wants her to come right from the start. Ichikawa watches the entire scene from the sidelines, and observes he's just putting on a facade when Yamada is all he cares about. Poor Kobayashi. He thinks he's actually interested in her. Ichikawa can't help but think of him as a pushover. He slumps and takes his place at his desk, still in disbelief as to how Kobayashi's defense could crumble so easily. Suddenly, he overhears Yamada and Kobayashi talking in private when Anna tells her she won't be going. Kobayashi is indifferent and says she'll just take Moko instead. Yamada tries to warn her not to go saying there'll be no fun. However, Ichikawa understands she's too nice to be directly mean to her friend and tells her she's being used as bait. Later that day, Ichikawa finds Yamada crying all alone in the library. Oops, she caught him worrying about her. He enters and she asks if he plays video games, and he responds that he does on Switch. He gets a flashback of his childhood calling the Switch and its controls dumb. The memories he's sealed away for so long are finally returning. Yamada continues to tell him her father plays video games, so they have everything at home. Suddenly, the girls who were hanging out with Haruya earlier enter and apologize on his behalf for being so forward. They automatically assume she has a boyfriend and is just pretending when she refuses, since she's all famous and needs to keep her private life a secret. She abruptly stands up smacking her hands on the table, insisting she doesn't have a boyfriend. Ooh, looks more like her telling Ichikawa than the other girls. The girls seem to realize something as they see the two and immediately take their leave. Ichikawa is confused and tells her she shouldn't hang around him in front of other people when the girl returns with Haruyo, who seems just as confused. Ichikawa steps back but Yamada grabs his face as he looks at them from the corner of his eye. The intruders leave and Yamada gets all awkward again and leaves. Ichikawa walks back to class, concerned that people are going to get the wrong idea about them. Meanwhile, in the classroom, Moko finally breaks it to Kobayashi how she's just being used. Yoshida also joins in, calling him a creep. Kobayashi struggles to hold back tears, and Ichikawa looks up to Yamada to protect her friend's feelings. As school ends for the day, Kobayashi admits to Yamada that she's decided not to go, and the two girls playfully return home. Ichikawa comes across Haruya, who turns around and leaves the moment he sees him. He wonders if people could possibly think that he and Yamada are a real couple but his thoughts get the better of him. 
As he stays up overthinking about everything that happened at school, he considers the possibility that he might just be being used to get Haria off her back. He makes up his mind that she's just been taking advantage of him all along. Yamada enters the classroom, and Ichikawa has stopped going to the library claiming he doesn't care anymore. He leaves and Yamada follows him out. He quickens his pace to avoid her, but she follows suit. She finally manages to grab his arm and pins him to the wall, but moves back a little awkwardly asking if he's mad at her. He says he's not and is leaving when Yamada apologizes again. For some reason, Yamada starts bawling like a child, and Ichikawa wonders, what if he was wrong to misjudge her and just looks for an excuse to hate her for no reason? He recalls his childhood of how he never bought video games no matter how much he liked them just because he was afraid of getting obsessed. In the present, he tries to tell Yamada that he just had some stuff to do during lunch, and he's not mad at her. She responds by enveloping him in a tight hug, squeezing hard since she's much taller than him. She apologizes saying it was just a hug to make up even though he doesn't like physical contact, but he refuses saying that's not the case. Oh, the sparks are flying. They're standing so close to each other, and Yamada hugs him again. Ichikawa is trying his best not to let himself believe that she might actually like him, and they decide to walk home together. Yamada continues to chatter about the best way to eat natto, and apparently, her secret is turning it around 40 times to make it taste delicious. Ichikawa really doesn't like it, and Yamada abruptly stops her chant and says she's sorry because she'd just been going on and on about it. He observes that they have very different senses, likes and dislikes in almost everything. They arrive at a junction where they're supposed to split and go their separate ways, but Yamada grabs onto the rear of his bike telling him to wait. Is she already obsessed with this dark and brooding hero? She suggests that they should talk some more, and he misinterprets it thinking she really doesn't have friends to talk to about her natto obsession. He's kind enough to share that he doesn't mind natto and fried rice, and she asks if he's going anywhere over the winter break. He realizes she's changed the subject but chooses to answer anyway saying he will be visiting his father's hometown in Akita. She seems to know all about the good food there, her shoulders slump, and she checks her calendar for the 24th. Ichikawa remembers to return her book that he's been carrying around for quite a while. They seat themselves on a few steps, and he admits he enjoyed the book more than he'd like to admit. She asks him about his favorite part, and Yamada's eyes sparkle and wonder as she exclaims that's the part she likes the most too. She says she'll bring the next one on Monday and suddenly remembers something that she refuses to share and says goodbye as she heads home. This time it's Ichikawa who can't let her go and tell her to hold up. Moko is disappointed in another Christmas without a boyfriend. It's finally Monday and Yamada continuously apologizes to Ichikawa because she forgot to bring the book she promised. He's chill about it but it seems like a big deal for her and she says she'll bring it the next day. Ichikawa reminds her they'll be on winter break starting tomorrow so she smartly plans to meet up somewhere. She builds up the courage to ask for his line ID. God, I can't believe she needed such an elaborate scheme for that, and Ichikawa too is in disbelief. They stay up texting each other most of the night. The next day, MC is standing in the middle of the city, waiting for Yamada. He reveals that he somehow ended up meeting with Yamada. Moreover, he plans to borrow the next volume of that rom-com manga. Though it confuses MC, why did Yamada ask him to meet in Shibuya? At this point, even MC is confused because they could have met at their local spot. Though Ichikawa somehow arrived way earlier, therefore he is standing alone while seeming to wait for Yamada. However, he suddenly spots Yamada. She also seems to arrive early. It confuses MC, so at first he starts to walk around her to confirm if it's really Yamada. Bro can't even recognize his girl. But as MC sees the girl enjoying her food in the middle of the crowd, he instantly recognizes her. Anyways, MC then approaches Yamada and asks her if they're supposed to meet at two. So, Yamada makes the same excuse as MC did. She said that she left home early so could find the place. Anyways, as MC mentions the manga, Yamada immediately interrupts him. She asks MC to accompany her to a new place that she wants to check out. Therefore, both of them start to walk, though MC notices that the city is crowded at this time. Well, most probably because it's New Year's Eve, though Yamada doesn't seem to remember the day it is today. MC then weirdly notices that Yamada smells really good. Anyways, MC feels a little low because he thinks that Yamada probably called him so she could run other errands, rather than spending her Christmas Eve with MC. Therefore, MC lowers his speed and decides to not walk side by side. Damn the amount of overthinking this kid does. Now, as Ichikawa is walking behind Yamada, he instantly sees his reflection in a mirror. 
He creeps NC out because he realizes that he looks totally like a stalker. Therefore, he lowers his hoodie and takes off his mask. However, that makes Yamada happy as she sees his face. So, Yamada decides to hand MC one side of the bag that Yamada is carrying. This way, they won't get separated and would carry the weight of that bag together. Hence, they again end up walking side by side. But as MC tries to distance himself from Yamada, she instantly notices it. So Yamada asks him to stick close or he'll get in people's way. Anyways, they arrive at a cafe and Yamada says that she wants to try their pancakes. And I want to try yours, Yamada. At this point, it starts to feel more like a date, though he doesn't like where this is going, as they are waiting in the queue. Yamada advises MC to avoid going to an amusement park on a first date. We'll count that as a hint. Well, apparently Yamada believes that waiting in line gets awkward, and the relationship starts to fall apart but since they are waiting in the line themselves. So Yamada says that her theory seems to be wrong, though Yamada immediately realizes that her tongue just slipped. However, NC doesn't understand what just happened. Instead, he comes up with his theory, that the guy should always stand in front of the stairs. Moreover, he thinks that's the reason why Yamada feels embarrassed. Both of them are equally dumb at this point. Anyways, NC asks Yamada to let him stand in front of her. She hesitantly declines, and so both of them try to make awkward eye contact. As Ichikawa asks Yamada about her hair, she describes how her mother does her hair, though it surprises MC since he thought her mother seems pretty strict. So Yamada explains that her mother always acts tough and strict when they are outside. But she's super nice at home, she even calls her Anna. Though, as MC calls their bonding cute, it somehow pisses Yamada off because she never heard Ichikawa say that word before, which confuses MC. I mean fair, she wants MC to call her cute or something. That's why she's pissed. Moments later, they finally manage to get a seat. Though Yamada begins to get confused because she can't decide what to pick. However, MC feels relieved because her mood instantly cheers up after looking at the menu. Since MC is acting like he isn't a big fan of desserts, he decides to get a coffee for himself. Though Yamada starts to feel bad as she sees MC not having anything to eat. Therefore, as she apologizes to MC, he starts to hesitate. Because he thinks that he somehow messed the situation up. Anyways, after ordering their food, Yamada notices that MC is wearing all black. So she asks him if he likes the color black. That's where MC realizes that he owns nothing but black clothes. However, Yamada also reveals that she loves the color black and has many clothes with that color. Weirdly, Ichikawa says that black clothes would look better on Yamada rather than on himself. He thinks if someone with a fashion sense would wear it, it looks stylish and cool, whereas MC just wears them because he can't avoid them. Basically, he's trying to say that he isn't a fashionable person. MC wears black because he likes it. MC then instantly realizes that he's literally explained fashion to a pro model. However, Yamada agrees with MC and reveals that her stylist said the same thing. And as Yamada starts to explain the story of what her stylist said, MC starts to wonder about the times he has messed up today. As MC drinks his coffee, he starts to regret coming with Yamada due to his mess-ups. Since they get along so well at school, MC thought that spending time on New Year's Eve would go great too. So Yamada interrupts MC and asks him to take her photo with her pancakes. Though she couldn't resist standing still as she saw her food. Therefore, MC starts to shoot a video of her, She's literally just eating in that video. Yamada then explains that she doesn't plan to upload those pictures. Instead, she sends them to MC, which eventually makes him blush. Moreover, MC starts staring at Yamada's video on the phone, which pisses her off. So Yamada stands and grabs MC by his chin and tells him to look at the real thing. So both of them sit quietly for a while as they are blushing. Later, MC accompanies Yamada in shopping. However, MC again feels embarrassed since Yamada doesn't let him pay at the coffee shop. He literally looks like a kid in front of Yamada. So Yamada starts asking MC which dress she should buy. He doesn't seem to have any interest, so he randomly chooses one. However, Yamada asks him to wait outside while she changes and wears it. MC starts getting creepy thoughts as he realizes that Yamada is changing behind a curtain. Therefore, he tries his best to distract himself from getting a hardwood. And to make the situation more difficult, MC notices Kana entering the same shop with her friends. And so Yamada removes the curtain as she reveals her new dress. Though MC asks Yamada to stay low since he doesn't want his sister to find out. Therefore Yamada pulls MC and decides to hide in the changing room. 
Hin Mem, why is it always the changing rooms? Yamada then asks MC why can't MC's sister see them together. So MC promises her that some other time he'll allow her to tell everyone. So MC tells Yamada to buy the dress that she's wearing since he finds her very appealing. And as Yamada faces backward, MC notices her back is revealed, since she hasn't zipped her dress, so he starts to freak out, while Yamada leans towards the wall. Later that night, MC and Yamada return from their hangout. That's where MC starts to share about himself with her. He tells Yamada that he's not a people person, and he's always straightforward. Further, MC reveals that he cuts people off easily. Therefore, he explains that if he stayed today with her, it means that he had fun. So that pleases Yamada, and she starts to wrap a muffler around Ichikawa's neck. Moreover, on their way to the station, both of them stop at the decorated street which amazes both of them. Anyways, as they arrive at the station, the train arrives, though the train seems to be crowded, so both of them get separated inside the train. Therefore, Yamada holds MC's hand so they may stay together. These kids had more romantic moments in a single day than my whole life. Moreover, even after arriving at their destination, both of them decide to walk to their home while holding hands. At this point, they just don't care if anyone sees them. Both of them are walking quietly and slowly in a dramatic manner. However, MC fears that Yamada might realize how he feels about her. Anyways, Yamada arrives towards her hand, and so they pull their hands back. Before MC would say Happy New Year, Yamada interrupts him. She explains that there are more days till New Year's, and so she expects to see him more before the New Year. Hence, both of them excuse each other and start to walk on their own. Though, as MC looks back, he realizes that Yamada disappeared. Turns out she was hiding behind the electric pole, and so Yamada jumps in front of MC and wishes him a Merry Christmas. It makes MC feel wholesome, as he feels like Yamada already knows his feelings toward her. Da, isn't it obvious? Later when MC is lying on his bed, he again starts overthinking the stuff that he should have done. Moreover, it pisses him off that he spent the whole day with Yamada. While thinking about this stuff, Yamada notices a person sitting next to him. That person is none other than the MC of the manga that Echikawa is reading. Okay, so now this kid is even having delusions. That person starts to lecture MC about yesterday. Moreover, he asks MC if he thinks he has a chance with Yamada. So MC tells him that they have held hands together and considers that as a sign, though Yamada usually gets touchy with her friends too. And so MC starts to have second thoughts. He doubts that she might be treating him the same as she treats a friend. Therefore, that imaginary person advises MC to man up and try to get in shape. He's literally 14. Then we see Kyotaro having problems sleeping. It begins with Ichikawa spending New Year's Eve at a diner. Moreover, he seems to be sitting between Nanju and Sakine, along with Mamiya. Though there are no interactions, everyone is sitting in awkward silence. How average E-Friends meetup goes. MC defines this situation as a living hell. However, Sakine asks him to switch places with her, so she can spend time with Nanju. Weirdly, MC's hand seems to be broken. Though Nanju asks Ichikawa about Yamada. Looks like something happened between Yamada and Ichikawa four days ago. It then cuts to Ichikawa, along with his family arriving at Akita. Ichikawa's grandma greets everyone at her home. However, the only problem Ichikawa finds in staying at his grandma's house is sharing a room with Kana. As he enters his room, Ichikawa receives a message from Yamada. She's literally flexing her food to him. However, Ichikawa remembers the time when Yamada mentioned that she always wished to see snow. So he promised Yamada to send her a photo of the snow. Therefore, Ichikawa goes out for a walk in this freezing weather things people do for love. As MC goes further into the forest, he sees a mountain and decides to take a photo of it to show Yamada. But as he accidentally walks further, he slips and slides down the hill. Moreover, his phone falls on the top. It takes a while, but Kana finally manages to find him by following his foot trail. Hence, due to the fall, Ichikawa's hand gets broken. Later, the whole family seems to be feasting together, while Kana is feeding MC since his hand is broken. He does realize that he has another hand too, right? Anyways, Ichikawa then sends his selfie to Yamada to show his hand. Later, he receives a video call from Yamada. Turns out Yamada is worried about his hand. However, Ichikawa gets excited as he sees Yamada in her top and pajamas. Furthermore, she's wearing glasses too. Though the kid somehow manages to control himself. So he then tells Yamada about how he got his injury. Anyways, as they were in the middle of their talk, Ichikawa saw Yamada looking to the right and immediately shutting up. Turns out, 
Kana woke up and now she's spectating their video call. What if he's 13? Every kid deserves privacy. At first, Ichikawa silently stares at Kana, but then he panics and accidentally hangs up the call. Kana finds Yamada cute, so NC says that she's just his classmate, which shocks her even more because she thought that he was just talking to a random streamer, though Ichikawa says that even he doesn't know if Yamada is his friend or what. Bro is literally exposing himself due to nervousness. However, MC realizes if Kana took the hint, she might tease him for eternity. But surprisingly, Kana just asks him to go to sleep as she walks back to her bed. It pisses off Yamada that he hung up on her. Though she asks him about what he said to his sister regarding their relationship, to which he replies that they are just friends for now. However, it makes Yamada blush when she gets the hint. Moreover, Yamada asks Ichikawa if she could call him again. So this time, he walks out to the hall and talks to her. Yamada starts to have a short talk with him like if he's hydrated or not. Furthermore, she asks him to drink at the same time as her. Oh, that was quite cringe. But what do we expect from them? Next, she asks him to have a look outside, which gives him goosebumps. So he captures the scenery and sends it to her. However, Ichikawa asks Yamada why she called him today. Though she gives no authentic answer. Moreover, these kids kept talking till sunrise and again, Yamada asked Ichikawa for a weird favor. She asks him to put his hand on his head and pat himself three times. On the other hand, Yamada is doing the same, but instead of her own head. She's using her teddy bear's head and assuming that the stuffed toy is Ichikawa. Oh boy, Yamada is in some mood today. She covers herself up by claiming that it's a sleeping trick. Hence, they finally ended their call and called it a day. So the next day, Ichikawa and Kana greet their grandma as they head back to Tokyo. On their way, they stop at a store where he buys a keychain of a dog for Yamada. Anyways on their way, Kana asks Ichikawa about Yamada. She further says that girls are more than their looks. Their charms are what really matters. At this point, Ichikawa feels like Kana is trying to tell him that Yamada is way out of his league. Though he also thinks the same. Moreover, he looks at Kana and realizes that she's the same as him. She always gives up on what she wants before she could regret it. Not sure what Kana has gone through, but she does give off a depressing vibe. However, Ichikawa's full focus is on Yamada right now as he keeps checking his phone. He is even rereading his chat with her. Once again, Kana starts to talk about Yamada, so this time, MC reveals Yamada's name to her. It immediately rings a bell in her head. She remembers that someone named Yamada left a note at her house back when MC was sick. However, due to her bad handwriting, Kana assumed that a boy left that note for Echikawa. I mean, that would be Saz. So now Kana believes that Echikawa might have a chance with Yamada. As she creepily glares at him, he saw that coming. Moreover, Kana finds Yamada awfully friendly. Therefore, she asks Ichikawa to introduce her to Yamada. As they return home, Kana reveals that she bought the same dog keychain to match her brother. Though Ichikawa seems to be in a rush as he walks outside, Turns out he's heading to visit Yamada to return her manga and the scarf she gave him on Christmas. Moreover, he finds this as the perfect opportunity to give her the gift that he bought. On his way, he nearly bumps into a dog that looks exactly like the one on the keychain. And that dog belongs to none other than Yamada herself. So Ichikawa asks Yamada if they were supposed to meet. To which she replies that she thought Ichikawa was injured, so he can't ride a bike. However, it blushes Yamada when Ichikawa asks her if she missed him. Yamada then introduces her dog to him, and so they go to the park. At this point, Ichikawa thinks that buying a non-food gift might be a bit much since they are just friends for now. Bro just hand that gift to her already. Moreover, MC thinks that he has to start thinking before acting from now on. Yamada then asks him to give a command to the dog that she trained. Turns out the dog isn't reacting to Ichikawa's command. Instead, Yamada is doing all those acts. He's commanding the dog, not sure what hints she is trying to give him by acting like a dog. And lastly, when Ichikawa asks the dog to paw his hand, Yamada immediately holds his hand as she sits right next to him. At first, both of them sit silently on the benches while holding hands, but then Ichikawa hands the scarf to her. However, Yamada reveals that she intended to give Ichikawa that scarf permanently. But she thought he didn't want it, therefore he returned it. At this point, Ichikawa feels embarrassed, but he somehow gathers his guts and finally hands the gift to Yamada. It excites Yamada so much that she starts to run in circles. On their way back, Yamada asks Ichikawa if he plans to visit the temple for New Year. Yup, she asked him out. 
so Yamada runs off to her home and tells him that she'll text him the place and time to meet. As days passed by, both Yamada and Ichikawa became addicted to each other, as they started talking every day by text messages. Anyways, on New Year's Eve, Ichikawa heads towards the grocery store to get his drinks. That's where he meets Nanju, who recognizes him as the bike kid. However, Sakain doesn't seem to remember Ichikawa's existence as she denies recognizing him in front of Nanju. Moreover, he takes MC to the diner. That's where the first scenario of this episode links up. So Nanju begins to ask about Yamada. He even asks Ichikawa if he has Yamada's line. At this point, Ichikawa gets pissed off because he realizes that Nanju is just trying to use him to get Yamada. Nanju further reveals that Sakin isn't revealing anything regarding Yamada. She's keeping the sys code. Therefore, he wants Ichikawa to help him out, since he's also Yamada's classmate. Though again, Sakin starts to pretend like she doesn't know him. Well, it's fair play, because it would just get worse if she admitted to knowing him. However, Mania doesn't seem to be keeping up with the act, as she mentions that Ichikawa is the kid who's close to Yamada. However, Sakin shuts her up halfway by kicking her, and luckily, Nanju doesn't get the hint. But that's where MC drags his phone out to check Yamada's message, which even Nanju sees. So Nanju acts like his heart has been broken because Ichikawa straight up lied to him before. Furthermore, he asks Mamiya to go and get him a coffee. So Sakin also joins her, so Ichikawa and Nanju are left alone. At this point, Ichikawa seems to be ready to fight with him. Though Nanju sits right in front of him, he then reveals that he won't tell anyone that he got Yamada's number from him. At first, Ichikawa starts to hesitate, but he finally gets the guts to say no to Nanju. Thank God, I thought he would give her number up. Furthermore, Ichikawa tells him that he has no reason to not give him the number. It's just he doesn't want to. That's when Sakin returns and asks Ichikawa to walk her home. However, she rejects Nanju when he says that he'll drop her at home. She even admits that Ichikawa is her friend in front of him. On their way home, Sakin holds MC's hand, but he manages to get back. At this point, it confirms to her that MC indeed likes Yamada. Anyways, he calls Yamada right after dropping Sakin home. Turns out he was craving to hear her voice, therefore he simply wished her a happy new year. Furthermore, Ichikawa decides that soon he will confess his love to Yamada. It's the day of the new year. Ichikawa and his family go to visit a temple, and it turns out Ichikawa double-booked it with Yamada. Poor kid has to balance his family and love life together, so Ichikawa plans to walk slowly so he could get behind. Then he would bunk his family to meet Yamada. However, his plan fails brutally when Ichikawa's mom spots Yamada waiting for him at the temple. Even Kana is shocked since it's her first time seeing Yamada face to face. Moreover, she gets impressed by her height as she calls her huge. So Khan asks Ichikawa if Yamada has a boyfriend. Though Ichikawa acts like he doesn't know, and that's where Detective Kana uses her big brain. She notices that Yamada is well-dressed and she keeps looking in the mirror. Moreover, she's practicing how to smile. So it concludes that Yamada is probably waiting for someone she likes. Now that's some Sherlock-level stuff. So Asai gets embarrassed, therefore Kana covers up by saying that she's just guessing stuff. However, Asahi refuses when Kana asks him to go and say hi to Yamada, because he believes that Kana would simply stalk them and later would tease him. He's technically right. Instead, Yamada walks towards Ichikawa as she notices him. Ichikawa's mother even introduces Yamada to his father, hence they all decide to visit the temple together. Though Ichikawa never imagined that things could even go this way. Moreover, he hopes to not do anything weird. At this point, even Yamada feels awkward. She taunts him about double booking this day. In the praying area, Ichikawa can't hold his hand to pray, since his one hand is broken. Therefore, Yamada holds his hands and prays for their wishes to come true. However, Ichikawa starts to tremble. But luckily, his parents and Kana seem to be waiting for them on the ground floor. Therefore, it relieves him of the fact that no one saw them. On their way, Yamada asks Ichikawa about his wish. So he reveals that he wished for things to remain the same way as they are, though it pisses Yamada off because she indeed wants some things to change. Finally, these lovebirds are taking things to the next level. However, Yamada cuts off from the Ichikawa family and walks her separate way. So Ichikawa's plan to bunk his family once again exists, and as expected, Kana starts to tease him. She thinks that both of them were acting so super mature, that Kana herself wasn't able to keep up with them. Well, even Ichikawa noticed that Yamada had some sort of grown-up look today, as she didn't do anything stupid today. As he is walking with his family, 
Ichikawa's mother mentions that she's starving, so they should stop somewhere to eat. That is where Ichikawa finds his opportunity and cuts them off. Though, surprisingly, Kana decides to join his brother, Ru, give them some privacy. Moreover, she grabs Ichikawa's hand and runs toward Yamada. Kana reveals that she wants to make a better first impression in front of her, and not just some boring teenager who was walking awkwardly with them before. After a few minutes, they finally manage to find Yamada. Looks like Yamada has bought multiple food items. She can barely speak since her mouth is full. That's where Kana offers Yamada to come over to their place. It shocks Ichikawa. However, Yamada agrees with her proposal. Hence, they start to walk toward Ichikawa's house. At this point, he is shocked because he never imagined that this day would turn out like this. Ichikawa even asks Kana why she invited Yamada over. At this point, she reveals that she finds Yamada quite charming, therefore she decides to invite her. Weirdly, Kana mentions that she wasn't expecting Yamada to be found while snacking this much. Moreover, she asked her if she was waiting for someone there. At this point, Kana even cracks the words that Yamada said when her mouth is full. She realized that Yamada was indeed waiting for Ichikawa, and that's why she bought extra food. Both Ichikawa and Yamada have some higher intelligence level siblings. As she finally solves the mystery, Kana shouts that Ichikawa really has a chance with Yamada. Though Ichikawa shuts her up on time. Anyways, they finally reach home. So when Yamada takes off her coat, the keychain that Ichikawa gifted her. So at this point, Ichikawa is worried since he told Kana that he bought the Akita dog keychain to match her. And if she finds this out, he'll be a living hell for him. So when Kana enters the room, Ichikawa holds Yamada and hides the keychain that is attached to her stomach. Kana freaks out as she sees her little brother holding Yamada just as they enter home. Therefore, Kana grabs Ichikawa away from Yamada and starts to stare at Yamada. At this point, Ichikawa thinks that Kana finally found out. Instead, Kana seems to be staring at Yamada's body. She feels surprised that a junior-year-old girl has such melons. Anyways, Kana then serves New Year's soup. While Yamada is having her soup, Kana and Ichikawa can't control themselves but envy Yamada's beauty. Moreover, Kana feels impressed by Yamada's confidence. At this point, I'm not sure which sibling is more obsessed with Yamada. So Kana then asks Yamada for her first name, so she could call her by that name. Now that they are friends, she even asks Ichikawa to suggest the name that she would use to call Yamada. Both of the girls surround Ichikawa and ask him to reveal Yamada's first name. Ichikawa starts to hesitate. He even asks Kana to back off since she's super close to him. So Kana taunts him by saying that he doesn't seem to mind Yamada being close to him. Anyways, Kana then decides to show Yamada the yearbook. She even shows the childhood pictures of Ichikawa, who doesn't seem to change that much. I mean, he is still a kid. Saz Yamada starts to check Ichikawa's past pictures while he hides his face in embarrassment. However, it shocks Yamada when she finds out that Ichikawa never went to school on an outdoor excursion. At this point, Kana finally decides to give them privacy. Therefore, she leaves the house. However, before leaving, Kana thanks Yamada for being friends with Ichikawa. It makes her happy that her brother finally made a friend. Moreover, Kana strikes a deal with Yamada. If she lets Kana call Yamada by her first name, then Yamada can call Kana her sister. Moments later, Yamada starts to wash the dishes, even though Ichikawa stopped her multiple times. So Ichikawa decided to hide those albums. However, Yamada seems to be following him everywhere he goes. She even snatches Ichikawa's album and begins to look at his photos. So both of them sit together on the bed while Ichikawa tells her about his two old best friends, Kinoshita and Takano. However, both of them got enrolled in private schools. Therefore, they are no longer in touch with him. Moreover, Yamada notices some trophies in his room, so he reveals that he won these from essay contests, poster competitions, local science fairs, and stuff. Ichikawa claims those days as his glory days. He even won a national prize for writing the book, Bizarre Crime Files of Murders. So he explains to Yamada that the book reveals the mind of murderers. It surprises Yamada because she is also into such psychological things. Therefore, she lies on the bed and asks him to read her mind. Though Ichikawa refuses it since she's not a murderer. However, Yamada notices a magazine under his bedsheet. So when she tries to take it out, Ichikawa jumps above her to stop her. Both of them start to turn red as they stare into each other's eyes. However, Yamada pushes him back slowly as she sits. Hence, she silently stands up and apologizes for going through his stuff. At this point, Ichikawa feels like he's done for good. 
However, Yamada starts to click photos of his childhood, while Ichikawa sits silently in embarrassment. And as she finishes clicking photos, Yamada starts to run downstairs. Hence, Ichikawa runs to stop her. Though Yamada seems to be smiling as she promises to show her yearbook the next time they meet at her house. And so, Yamada takes her leave. It takes a moment, but Ichikawa finally gets the hint that Yamada has invited him over to her house. Anyways, we then see a glimpse of Ichikawa's past, about the time when he realized that he got enrolled in another school than his friends. Moreover, everyone used to avoid him, since he used to read weird books about murders. No wonder why he was always lonely, he is too young for such books. However, now Ichikawa doesn't care if it freaks anyone out. Now he has Yamada on his side, hence he packs his bag and heads outside to his mother's car. Even Kana joins the ride to drop her brother at school. Yamada seems to be waiting outside the school for Ichikawa, and as he arrives she gets happy. Moreover, she greets Kana and Ichikawa's mother. Kana asks Yamada to take off Ichikawa since his hand has begun to heal recently. However, Yamada starts to stare at his bag. Turns out, she's looking for the matching keychain that he bought for her. So Ichikawa shows Yamada the matching strap as he takes it out of his bag. Did he just steal his sister's keychain? Anyways, Yamada hangs his keychain to his shirt button, since Ichikawa doesn't want to hang it on his bag. At this point, Ichikawa starts to get flashbacks about the moments that he spent with Yamada. He feels strange that about a year ago, he never wanted to come to school, and would always cut off from events. Therefore, he gives credit to Yamada for changing him. Though, Yamada uses the Ona reverse and tells him to thank himself, because if he wouldn't come to school, then both of them would never be friends in the first place. It makes Ichikawa quite emotional, therefore Yamada hugs him, and this time, Ichikawa also holds her and thanks her. Then we see Yamada sharing sweets with him as both of them walk towards their class.